o'clock. We'll go ahead and get started, call the meeting to order. And uh, before we do, I just want to say thank you for all of you being here this evening. It is always great to see friendly faces in the crowd. And uh, glad you're here. Council Long here. Council Holmes here. Council Hires here. Council Rattler here. Right, come on. Okay, the invocation is by Sandra Dearborn from the Eleven Church Center. Are you here? Yes. Okay. If we would stand, please. <laughs> Our Heavenly Father, tonight we come and invite your presence for the sake of our families and citizens in Tahlequah. You know the needs of our community even before we ask. Therefore, we humbly ask that you cover us and our people, your children, with good decisions and the topics that we discuss tonight in our meeting. We desire to see prosperity and good health and safety at the core of the decisions within our community. We have many ills and social issues that often consume our time, our town. Bestow your insight and wisdom to us, which is above ours, to our discussion and decision-making process. It is with this in mind that we submit our thoughts and decisions for good outcomes. Direct us in the right paths, with the right motives, with the right results, because we look to you for our direction. Thank you for covering and your for your covering and for your protection from calamity and telephone and for the help in the affairs of us as people in our natural, beautiful location with the many natural and spiritual blessings that you have provided for us to enjoy. In the name of the Lord God Almighty, we pray for these blessings and give our thanks. Amen. Amen. is and basically the object of the hospital is to operate a eight 
bedroom general acute care hospital. That is what the auditors say, and I'm sure the trusted degree correlates with that. It will tell you all the component units in, in, in there. And then in, in addition to that, if you flip back, uh, and you'll notice that the operating income as a component unit was a loss of 602000 This is the column pages here, okay? But the non-operating income was two million four, which indicates an actual profit to the co company. Now, the question what I this concern is, what is the non-operating income? The operating income is the reoperation and care of patients. Okay, so I'd like you to address that. And it does, it has the explanation of the credit balance in the account receivable account. I've included every page in the auditor's explanation there too, okay? I did include with this the rating, okay, very probably, okay? In addition, the last page is the CMS report and the reference to readmission penalties associated with the hospital. So I'm requesting the council to do to take the appropriate action to help the city of Tahlequah and its citizens try to obtain control of the particular situation now that I've discovered all this information. If you have any questions, I'll be readily available for your counsel. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Guzman. Does anyone else have a public comment they would like to make? <clears throat> Hearing none, we will move on to the consent agenda. These items are placed on the consent agenda so that members of city council by unanimous consent can designate routine items to be approved in one motion. Any item proposed on the consent agenda not meeting with the approval of all council members will be removed and heard in regular session. <coughs> item G has been removed for discussion. Are there other items? <coughs> Do we have a motion on the items excluding G? Second. We have a motion second. Could you have a roll call, please, Clerk? Councilor Long? Yes. Councilor Thomas? Yes. Councilor Hires? Yes. Councilor Ratton? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. We will move on to the uh, recognition of service for October employees. Um, your name is Paul. Would you please come forward? Uh, Mark Whitmore, 20 years with the fire department. Randy Jordan, 10 years school resource officer. Brian Spangman, 10 years school resource officer. And Lynn Riles, 41 years animal <coughs> control. Is Mr. Riles here? He's not, but I just want to, uh, I think we should give him a, just a hand um, of his 41 years of service and just recognize that what he does, I know at our special meeting there was kind of reference of a dog catcher, but he's actually animal control and, and anybody that lives around Tahlequah knows that there's a lot more than this dog around here and he does a lot of it. He's been doing it for 41 years, so. <laughs> a written report from the library. Um, is there a report from the Chamber of Commerce? Yes. Stephen Wright with the Tyler Perry Chamber of Commerce. Um, 
I'll say up front that I'm fighting the same gunk that everybody else has going on, so kind of bear with me through this. I'm going to give you an update on how things are going to change uh, this month. Roll the wheel down. Roll the wheel. Dang, that's fancy. All right, first I'd like to welcome our new chamber members. Uh, Riverbend Floats, uh, Rob Franks had a good operation out there, check him out if you've had a very, very beautiful place, good operation. Uh, C3 Customer Contact Channels, and the U.S. Army Recruiting, we now have the Army behind us, so that's a bad night, right? Yeah. Uh, we have member renewals, uh, we have one, two, three, those guys all renewing, I can go through them. Uh, <laughs> wants to redo that real quick, we appreciate the renewals. Uh, in the news, uh, we did a ribbon cutting for the Relay of Life Cherokee County, the Rollover Cancer event ribbon cutting. Um, I believe that uh, they raised uh, over $150 million in the state of Oklahoma for cancer research, so that is amazing. Uh, Anthus Brandon Sports Complex Ribbon Cutting. Several of you are in that photo. Congratulations on that. Uh, we are launching a new program called Lunch and Learn. Once a month, uh, we will have a program to help educate chamber members about technology, marketing, business practices, and more. Uh, it obviously includes lunch. It's informal. Come as you go, or come, come go as you please. And uh, it's about 45 minutes to one hour just to kind of uh, let people know about new technologies, how to do certain social media, um, and other, other things like that that people may be missing out on and help with, and we're open to suggestions on classes. Um, I'm actually going to host the first class on November 5th at 12 p.m. at the Wright Real Estate Conference Center, uh, which is right behind Walgreens. There's some nice new little trees out there that you'll see today, so um, it is right there. Uh, I will go over the Chamber Member app and directory. We made some enhancements to our directory where now you're, uh, you would go to the Chamber directory and it was a bland, you had your phone number and address and stuff like that. Now we enhance it to where it's basically a web page for your business that comes with your membership that you can put all of your information on. Um, your logo comes up in search results, photos, links, enhanced descriptions. You actually show up in Google ranking with this. And um, I'll go over the app that all members have access to now. Um, I, as an example, just to show you guys, did help in crisis. This is what they look like on our uh, search page. It doesn't really stand out. Um, now we've added their logo. Now you can see them better in the search results. Here's what their page on our directory looked like before. This is what they get now. Uh, beautiful page, some graphics on it. Uh, that is the top part with the description. And then you scroll down. And they can put a video. These are links under the highlights over there that go to different parts of their website. And we've got photos. So a really big thing that chamber members need to get into. Um, this is now included with your membership at no extra cost. So uh, some big things that we're bringing to you guys. Are able to do that themselves? Absolutely. And I'll teach you how to do it at class. <laughs> now, Stephen, is any of this kind of chamber master, or is this something? This that this is about? chamber master. It's chamber parts master? that were being unused. I so I yeah. So we've been digging around in there and, okay. and started unlocking things that were locked. So these are these are features that are going to make pretty good changes to, to some people locally. Uh, this is kind of what the inside of the app looks like. And I'll go through it in the class at this first lunch and learn. And I'm going to record it. And we'll get it out to all chamber members. So in case you miss it, you'll be able to do it yourself or stop by and see me and I can help you. Uh, again, that's November 5th at 12 p.m. right after the next city council meeting. Uh, we also, uh, and uh, there goes. real estate market update. How cold listing sold year to date? 223 homes, 39 tracts of land, 11 commercial properties. I think 11 commercial properties were sold all of last year, so we're doing better there. That's good. Uh, and then Cherokee County. Listings close, uh, 324, 98 tracts of land, and 13 commercial properties. Uh, and our buyers, where are they coming from year to date? 57% uh, are local, 33% uh, are outside of the Cherokee County, and 10% are out of state. Um, last year we had our Cherokee County a little higher, um, so the out of state is taking a bigger bite out of the percentage this year. Uh, upcoming events. 
North Economic Development Regional Summit is October 22nd, 2019. This is a huge event uh, for the region and we are happy to have it here. So I suggest um, everybody attend this. If you're a local business owner, check it out at neokregion.org. Um, definitely something to look at. Uh, we have AM Live, Wake Up with UBC's Coffee Conversation and Connection at Remax Select this Friday at 8 a.m. If you haven't been to one of those, please go. And here are our upcoming events. Take over Columbus at the skate park. Uh, the big idea is tomorrow night at the Armory. There are three projects up. There are murals in Tahlequah, bike racks, and the other one is a sign for downtown business. I suggest you check that out. Uh, Kwanis Barbecue and Chili Cook-Off at the venue uh, this Friday for uh, OU Texas. Uh, Oaks Wagon Festival is Saturday morning right downtown. Tidy Up 10 Killers October 18th. Helping Crisis Masquerade Ball is October 22nd. 26th and movies in the park is October 26th as well. That's all I have for you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. A report from Tour Telephone. Keep everything. What's that? Yeah. 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 A good example of that. Hi, I'm Gianna McPhail, Director of Sierra Telephone. Uh, okay, moving right along. Uh, some of the things that we have been doing this last month has just been really busy. But one of the, the things that I really wanted to bring awareness to is our promotion that we have been doing. Uh, normally, we print 40,000 visitor guides and we still even have some left over after the two years and we've already distributed 30,000 this year in one year. So we'll be reprinting, which is pretty amazing. Um, we're still promoting Tahlequah as a film location destination. Our website is being redesigned and we moved forward here. This last month we had somebody call us. We had an increase in like I am so sick. I'm sorry. We've been caught Cindy and I have a virus and we uh, we had some some people call us from different publications. We had a writer come in from the Edmund Sun. She wrote an article about Telegraph about all of that there's to offer. She said at one of our locations, sort of great story about that. We had two shows that were on the Oklahoma Road Trip with TravelOK.com that was promoted. And then a lady just out of the blue called us with the Roadrunner publication and they're writing a second feature story about Tahlequah, which is really cool. That is an international publication, by the way. Uh, our paid views are up. 45% over this time last year on our website, which is really great. Our new users are up 47% over last year. And our sessions are up 40% over this time last year. This is something really cool that we had. We we're promoting Tahlequah as a group organization destination. One of those that visited us last month was the Antique Automobile Club. There were 40 vehicles Two per person, or two per vehicle, so it's roughly eight people. They came in these vehicles. They were 1916 or older. They stayed here for three days. It was really great. And because they love the area so much, they are now having two more antique automobile clubs coming and staying with us. They were here for three days. They visited. They ate here. It was great. They loved it. Um, that's just a few of their pictures. This was something that was um, kind of been an ongoing project. This lady, her name is Catherine. She called from San Francisco. She came to stay here for a little over a week. She's a screenwriter. And now her screenplay or her movie is has been chosen as one of the top three, uh, the top three finalists for the Tulsa Film Festival, which starts on Wednesday. So we wish her the best of luck. If this goes into a baby, she's actually having it um, filmed here in Tahlequah. That's her choice. And the location of the movie is Tahlequah, 
tank taller and the Tulsa Ballet. So just bringing more promotion to the town of Fire. So there you go. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 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 Main Street Association. Anyone here from Main Street? <laughs> and any of the city departments have a report you want to share? Okay, then we will move on to item number five, discussion possible action on items removed from the consent agenda, which would be item number G, to approve a street drainage and utility easement for the following described real estate. And then there is a long legal description, um, also known as a part of 1313 South Muskogee Avenue, Tahlequah, Oklahoma. Yeah, I'd just like, like to know what it is. You just want to know what it is? Yeah. It's the, uh, <coughs> the right way is necessary for the South Missouri Lightning Project. Uh, that address is Asian Star. Okay. So it's, now we have one remaining. So the easement is further. Mm -hmm. okay. Congratulations on getting that easement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One for, more. For the North. For the, Quite some time trying to obtain that. Okay. Yep. Do we want to take action on that? There's a motion to approve this. Second. second. A motion to second. Do we have a roll call? Council Jones? Yes. Council Byers? Yes. Council Ratliff? Yes. Council Long? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Item number six. Uh, approve 
And this is to remove the tower, correct? I don't think it's going to be removed. I think they're going to trade out some equipment on top of it. So, but no, he didn't say anything. He's going to tell these parents, he's going to tell his paragliders and just drop them off up there. <laughs> I agree. Uh, any other questions that I can answer? I mean, do we know what the alternative is for them? No. no, I would say uh, get get it and set it down with a helicopter. I'll say we can do that a lot on tall structures. Craig, is Craig the AGT rep? Excuse me? Craig, is that the AGT rep that came here? Uh, yeah. Have you heard anything from him about this? No. Have they even given us an idea as far as, you know, a, a date range? That, uh, I do know, uh, that would be up to the city of Tomball to tell them when they can come and do it, and which I'm assuming would be four weekdays. I don't know. But, uh, the, the young man did tell me that, uh, <clears throat> you know, four days could be any four days you choose as long as they're consecutive days. You know, when I went to Justin <coughs> for the litigation this year, they did all their street work at night. Mm -hmm. So maybe we could tell them they could do it at night. Maybe. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, it takes so long to set this thing up. You have to set it up and start adding sections to the boom as you. And they couldn't do that at night when people are sleeping? Well, they could, but they'd spend all the time taking that part and putting it together. I mean, it's, 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 it's such a chore that he said that they yeah. didn't intend to move it, that they would set it up and come and work long shifts and get it done in four days. Mm -hmm. Well, Wayne, I'll, Wayne I'll, go with your, I'll go with your recommendation and I'll... I made a motion to deny the request. Second. Have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? If I will try and contact them if they still and I, I didn't think about getting hold of AT and T, but if they come up with some good rationale, I will bring it back to you. So possibly sizable rent. Excuse me. Possibly sizable rent. Yes. I mean, I think yeah, well, yes, sir. I, I mean, Wayne and I are about the same age, but the rest of them weren't here when that was built. Mm -hmm. I was here when that tower was built, and they used a crane from the back side and built it. You know? And, I've seen, the, and I've seen the helicopters <laughs> lift heavy stuff up and down those towers that the Wayne's right they can do it with the helicopter. Mm -hmm. And maybe they're big. Crane they want to use now won't fit back there, but it was built with a small crane from the back side. Can you just let him get away with it, man? Slide right under the radar. He did. Well, like I say, it, I, I remember when it was built, you know. Thank you. Well, so do I. I hope so. Have a motion and a second. And
Um, I know that the mayor and I discussed this week and and was this <coughs> just one minute right? And uh, I think it was pretty interesting information. Um, and if you the, the one I gave you was the council handbook, and we'll talk about that at item number twelve. But on pages thirty-eight through forty, to me it was a good refresher of um, those different items on that stability test and what they mean, where where those questions are coming from. So looking at the information and and seeing where the city stands and not doing that before. So that's really just there for your information. There's no action to take on it. This is something that they'll do every year. So that's all that I have on it. Unless you guys have any questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It says due October the 15th, that's the changes? That is, I will talk about that on item number 12. Can we move? <coughs> Was there anything about the stability test scores that stand out to you? Well, in light of um, what's going on in our community today and looking at the highest score on that test for our community, um, the crisis management, and, and whether it's a situation that we have going on here or if it's other natural disasters, um, I live out on Lake Tintiller and I know that when the tornado came through, you know, I saw the emergency management, Mike Underwood, he actually was one of the first people that my husband saw as he went up to the highway when the sun rose to find out what in the world had gone on because it was dark. And um, so, I mean, to me, I, I thought that really showed a lot. I, I think that there's obviously things for improving and um, the two gentlemen that came with Ruth and a Bill Tackett and uh, Mr. Weatherford, uh, both you know, explained that to you guys. I thought the information they gave was very valuable um, for you to use as a body and to build on and, and to try to to streamline things and make things more productive and, and some of those those recommendations that he had. So in, in light of that, I, I felt that for the first time to take this information and having a variety of people in our audience, you know, including our governing body, but we had employees and we actually had some people from the public, the, the scores were, you know, they were in there with, with others, so great, thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Pape about the stability test scores themselves? If not, then we'll move on to number 12, discussion regarding the council handbook. Yes, um, the council handbook, um, as explained in um, the, the recognition training that was presented on the 16th, uh, part of that program is to adopt a council handbook. And so OMAG does supply a sample and it is attached, it is there for you. I know um, I had an opportunity to go over it briefly today. There are some things that I do want to point out that I definitely want to make sure that it gets reviewed by um, Grant and, and the mayor and, and really the, the, the entire body. But on pages 19 and 20 are a couple highlights. Pages 34 are items that I highlighted in yellow so they're very clear. So pay attention to that. Uh, but this is a sample. Um, I was able to reach out to uh, another municipality that has uh, gone through this, the recognition training for the last three years. Um, so they get those dollars every year from OMAD um, that, that they can do with, you know, it's not something that's a budgeted item, it's something that they can do something else with. And was able to get a copy of their handbook. And uh, it's pretty simple to, to the, the sample that they've given us. But OMAG does give you the liberty to change that. This is your handbook that you would use, um, you know, it's yours. But it is something that has to be completed to meet all of, of, of that recognition. So the training that you experience, the stability testing, and the third piece is the handbook. So I put that there. Um, Tess is, has graciously offered to, to assist me in trying to combine everything in that handbook and get it to a final draft. Um, so that hopefully we can present it via resolution at our next meeting at have mid-month or even November 1 and read it for you. But if we get everything by the 15th, she can compile it and get it to Grant and that gives him a little time to, to review that. So I don't see any action more 
uh, just a, kind of a handout. The last, um, like I said, the last three pages has those, those things on the stability testing. So it's kind of fun to go back and read that and um, and look at those results again. But again, that information is for you. And I don't. That's not actually her email address, is it? Um, it is. E S E C S E C. Oh, you E E S. E -S. Yeah, there. You guys all know how to get a hold of Tess, right? Does everybody have that? Or that as well? Any other questions or comments? Very then we will move on to item number 13, discussion and possible action regarding benefit renewal for city of Tahoe employees and or agents. Would you like to move forward with this one? Yes. Well, I will start with, um, first, is, is just to let you know that um, the mayor and I have spent roughly the last four months working on and off on our benefit renewal. Uh, tonight we have our broker with us, Brian Hill Hilliard, with uh, Benefit Health Advisors. And so I'm going to turn some things over to him. He has a presentation. We'll go over a few things. I have some handouts. Um, that I will give you, and I'm going to go ahead and make it burn. So, as you mentioned, I'm Brian Hillier, Benefit Health Advisor. I've uh, been working very close with Malin and Sue as we went through the renewal process. Uh, I've been working with the city, although I haven't presented the city council, and working with the mayor, the administrator, HR, finance, uh, for about nine years. So very familiar with the program that you have. And uh, just wanted to go through a couple of things. So um, based off of the based off of the utilization of the medical plan, and I know that it was presented in your meeting, uh, that we are exceeding uh, the amount that we had in our reserve account for our self-funded program. And so was was actually multiple Multiple things led to this decision or to, to the process that we went through. So first thing is, is that we had a very high utilization on the medical plan. Uh, from a budget perspective, uh, could we make budget based off of the renewal? And, and so we did go through and do that bid process. Uh, we went out to the entire market. Uh, we went to Blue Cross. We went to United, Cigna. You're currently utilizing Aetna, but we did go to them for a fully insured quote, National General, Starmark, and so forth. Um, with that said, there's three different things that we look at when we do a bid. A lot of times we, we like to look at the pricing. Uh, that's, that's typically where we start, so it is very, very important. Uh, but there was a lot of work done uh, between everyone uh, in HR and with the mayor as well. And not just reviewing the pricing, but also reviewing adequate networks. Uh, we did look at the top 30 providers of where members are actually going. So we did do a review of the network, as well as the benefits. Uh, we did the drill down into uh, not just the high level of deductibles or co-pays, but how will this affect members individually if we were to make a change. And so we did provide you with the high level results. Uh, we simplified it for you rather than giving you five or six pages of numbers and benefits. Uh, we simplified it to just the current and then the ultimately the recommendation. So very high level, the current, the current cost, uh, the estimated month or the estimated cost was 1.1 million. Just say estimated total cost was 1.1 million. Uh, the total of where we're actually running, so we did hit the maximum on our self-funded plan, it was 1.3 million. And uh, from a renewal perspective, uh, estimated cost was actually 1.5 million. So this is from November, 20, November 1st, 2019 through October 31st, 2020. The estimated cost was 1.5 million. Uh, but based off of the contracts that we were able to get, the maximum cost for the city jumped to 1.8 million. 
So again, based off of utilization, basically they take, on a self-funded program, they take our utilization, they build in medical inflation, and then they set it at a 25% corridor. So again, because we did hit the maximum and actually exceeding the maximum, when you're running over, over your maximum, say 110%, they go 6% inflation, 25% corridor, they want a 40% increase, that's what you're seeing, 1.3 to 1.8. The one thing that we did know underneath, there are a couple of large ongoing claims, which is obviously causing that to increase. On a self-funded program, if they know of a cost, they do require that you cover that cost behind the scenes. So that did that, that included about 300,000 of it. Uh, and then also just noting that our reserve is at zero. And so if we were to continue down the self-funded program, we would need to build that reserve back up. And so from the 1.8 million, it's noted there that typically we want four months of claims, which would be an additional 210 to 280,000. Uh, with a long-term planning over the next three years, we want the reserve to be closer to 400 to 500,000. Knowing we couldn't get there in one year, the one-year goal would be 210 to 280,000. You would have to add that to the 1.8 million. So if we were to renew on the current program, the ask would be close to two million. That would allow us to cover our max claims, plus guarantee that we would start building our reserve back up. Very difficult decision. Uh, you know, we've been with Maritain, and for as long as I can remember, we've done the bids. So we've gone to Blue Cross, we've gone to United, we've gone to Cigna, we've done the bids. Uh, Maritain is a third party administrator. Behind the scenes, who's actually setting the rates. We work with about 15 different stop loss carriers. So this isn't one quote. Uh, there were about 15 quotes to keep our current model. And this was the most competitive quote, was to go from 1.3 to 1.8. Uh, with that said, uh, the most competitive bid that did come in, if you look on the, the sheet that was provided, it's under plan A. This is with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Oklahoma. It is fully insured, so we would know our rates going into it. Uh, without diving into their under, underlying guidelines, uh, it's a little bit more pool than a self-funded program. We benefited uh, a lot by being on a self-funded program in the years past. Uh, the last few years have been very, very heavy. But with Blue Cross Blue Shield, it's a, it, it is a little bit more pool where they have their their geographic and demographic rates, and then only a percentage of our utilization is calculated into the rates. Because of their underwriting uh, guidelines, they came in the most competitive. Uh, known cost is at 1.27 million. Uh, again, that's fully insured. We know our cost going into it. The only thing that city council should know is, well, you know, again, the mayor is very well aware of it. Uh, as well as HR, we've had lengthy discussions. When we do terminate our program, there will be claims that are incurred but not received. Uh, we call it lag. And so we do need to budget appropriately. If we were to terminate our current program, and depending on the calculation that you look at, we're, the recommendation is that we need to have two months on hand, which is equivalent to 140,000. So, we do need to, when we look at the 1.2 million, we do need to, for the next 12 month period, we do need to have 140,000 to pay the claims that are incurred but not received. Note that is an estimate. Uh, we actually did run some reporting. Our actual claim lag is 1.45, which is about uh, 53 to 55 days, which would actually mean that two months is, two months is overstating how much we need, but when you actually look at our trend, the last three to four months have been very heavy. Uh, your most recent check register, uh, 70,000 alone, that was one week's worth of claims. Uh, and so, give or take, two months, of two months, 140,000. So we will need that to continue out, pay out the program that we have. Uh, there is a small Maritain admin to process their claims. Uh, roughly, I'm going by memory, it's about 15,000. It's 
four and a half months of admin to get six months of coverage. So we really need 155,000 to close out the current program. So 155,000 to close out the current program. If we don't want to close out the current program, we would be able to renew at 1.8 million. And the recommendation would be to uh, start building that reserve. We need an additional 210 to 280,000. Uh, with that said, uh, since we are making it, recommending that we make a change to Blue Cross Blue Shield, one of the things that we looked at, uh, currently we only have one plan, and as you know, it's very costly to add a family, and uh, so one of the things that we were actually looking at under the current program, but now moving, you know, assuming that we move forward with Blue Cross Blue Shield, we did bring in a second plan design to try to make it more affordable. Uh, and so plan A is very similar. If you go through the line, the line items of the plan, plan A is very similar to the current program, but in order to give the employees an option of saying, do you, would you want to have lower amounts coming out of your pocket, your paycheck? Uh, we did, throw, we did uh, put a $3,000 deductible on here, and uh, you can see the employee costs associated with it. Uh, a lot went into this. Again, uh, this is probably three or four minutes spill of where we're at. Uh, but we have probably done 15 conference calls, three face-to-face -face meetings, and work after hours. So. Yeah, <laughs> so, so. I would also like to point out that to take plan A, the employee cost would go from $25 per month to $50 per month. But if they stay with Plan B, it would stay at $25. So they have an option to not have the increase in the amount they pay out of pocket for the health insurance. And not to get into a lot of the details, but uh, you know, for me, from a personal standpoint, I thought it was good that um, our current plan is not have to go pay to go to the doctor. So both of these plans have that kind of situation built in, um, which is nice. Our current plan is a $600 deductible you have to need it before. So if you go to the doctor that first visit, it is, you know, hitting your deductible. And I, I experienced that personally, you know, so um, I didn't have that 20 or that 25 or that $30 copay where you just pay, get your, you see the doctor and move on. Um, so it was very, very attractive. The prescription plan, we worked very, very hard um, looking at that and, and there's a lot of prescriptions. And why we do have a very generous prescription plan on our current plan, the plan that Blue Cross and Blue Shield has, there are some prescriptions that are going to cost our employees absolutely nothing. Zero dollars. They pay a low amount now, but it would be zero dollars. And one of the values of that copay is it allows or encourages employees to go to the doctor when they first become ill rather than waiting until they're so ill they need to go to yeah. the urgent care or emergency. Okay, so we, for our work, we don't use Blue Cross Blue Shield of Oklahoma. We use Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois. And yeah. so is that something when you guys priced this and looked at your other options? Did you also consider that? So the Blue Cross Blue Shield, and we actually brought the representative with us, so in case there were specific questions, so this is Elders Jackson. Uh, they'd be able to answer the specific questions, but in regards to your question, uh, it is based off of where the where the headquarters is located. So if you're currently with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois, that means the headquarters is in Illinois. Uh, it is not something that we're able to access into another Blue Cross Blue Shield. But we did go through every option that is available. So Blue Cross, we looked at their fully insured and self-funded. You are only eligible for the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Oklahoma. Uh, United Healthcare, they don't do it by state. They actually, it's the same company throughout all 50 states, so we looked at their fully insured and self-funded. Cigna is the same thing as United. Aetna, we are currently with the same thing as United. Uh, but Blue Cross Blue Shield, that is the only option for your location. Just to clarify, the plan A and plan B that you presented, these are self-funded, we be self, are we currently self-insured? They're we're currently self-insured. Okay, and then we will continue to be self-insured. These are fully yeah, funded. funded. This is fully funded. Correct. The cost that you see, the employee, the employee spouse, employee child, and the family, okay. that is the known cost that we would pay. Okay. 
And are we you know, looking at the looking at the plan A? That's one point two seven million. That's the total cost. It's known going into. It. And that's if everybody enrolls in in you know over right. to the far left is what our current enrollment is. Right. Our current enrollment: one hundred thirty-one singles, one employee spouse, one employee child, and five families. Mm -hmm. So the column right in there is what it costs the city. And then what you have to the side is what it costs. Our current renewal with um, our current carrier as self-funded. So to answer the yeah, to answer your question, the total amount that you see, the 1.3, the 1.8, and the 1.27, that is the total cost between the city and the employees. The the amount to the side is what right now the employees pay $25 for the single, and they pay 704 for any of the tiers. And so this is basically showing what what we would recommend, given that it's going from two tier to four tier. But that 1.2 million is the total, the city and the employees. It's not the city's portion. That's the total premium that would be paid to Blue Cross. Does that go down if if we choose plan A and B, which you said that's the cheaper plan, so we could offer both? Correct. Our, what we're recommending is to offer plan A and B. So does so, 1.2 go down? Yes, the 1.2 goes down. If everyone were to enroll in plan B, the cost would go down to 979000 And then the, we would back out what the employee's portion would be. So, so yes. do we have any time to change the calculations of what those employee contributions would be? I mean, because we're looking at a three hundred thousand dollar variance between whether or not we're going to drive a Cadillac or a Ford, and right now, if you haven't heard, we're a little short on cash around here at the city of Tahlequah. So, three hundred thousand dollars would be really nice, and we can't always afford to drive a Cadillac, you know. So that's kind of what I see right here, and I know this has great value to our employees, and we want our employees to have everything we can possibly give them. But I think the biggest thing we're trying to give them right now is to everybody keep their job. So. But that's a the recommendation is to do both, right? Well, so it's not I, yes, $100, because I think that, I mean, trying to look at it, and, and this is something that, that the mayor and I have worked very closely on, is trying to have the least amount of impact. Why we certainly understand there's a lot of issues with cash flow with the city of Tahlequah. There, while this isn't a very welcoming idea, but it's not the sole cause of that. And, and certainly we want that impact to our employees to be as minimum as possible. We've worked very, very hard, very diligently in having that other option. I mean, when you look at that, that's a $3,000 deductible. That maximum amount of pocket is um, for, or it's, it is a 7,000. Right now, they set it two. They have a $600 deductible. So that is a pretty big jump if you go outside of just regular doctor visits. It could be a pretty imp pretty big impact to our employees. So what if so if they all enroll in one, it's a two point seven. If they all enroll in B, it's a nine seventy nine. What if what well, it's half and half? That's fine. That's yeah, and so that you know that the savings isn't to the oh, one point two. I didn't the do yeah, so the city is basically the way that we came up with these calculations, that the city would pay the same or very close to the same on plan A and B. The difference in pricing is what the employee would realize. So if your employee spouse today, you're paying 704, if you eat plan A, you're going up to 720, so you're seeing a $16 increase. But if you're willing to go to plan B, you're going from 704 today down to 540. So it's not costing the city more or less. It's we try to come up with the basically it's giving it to the employee saying if you take on the risk, you can do this. And and plan B is set up more for those that want to cover employee spouse, employee child and family to give them a more affordable option. Today it's today it's $704. Uh, to cover your family on plan A, that's going up to 950. Yeah, we're basically giving five families a $200 a month increase plus, and we're going back to them and saying, you have an option to actually cut it, cut it by $100. So the savings is going to the employee. The only one that's not true is the employee only. And the reason being is that 
if the city paid what they pay on the plan A, we would actually have to pay the employee to take plan B. Like we'd be paying them. We'd say, hey, take plan B and we'll give you more money. Uh, and so, you know, the employee only is more, you know, we can only charge so much, we can only do so much, uh, but that's how, it, that's how we came up with these calculations, is really plan B is to try to give the employees a more quotable option, but they are the ones realizing the savings. A uh, couple things to note that I just point out that may or may yeah. not be yeah. included yeah. in the packet. Yeah. Uh, so the first thing is, is that right now through the Maritime program, uh, every employee does have $10,000 of life insurance. Uh, so there is a benefit. Through Blue Cross, if we do add the life insurance, uh, which we would move forward to not cut, a, cut that from the employee, we would write it with Blue Cross Blue Shield. I say this with him standing here, uh, but your benefit is $10,000. Other cities, counties, muni municipalities, employers, they'll have 10, maybe they'll have 50 or 100,000 of life insurance. Uh, and so their policy is, is if you write the life insurance with the medical plan, they'll give you a 1% reduction on your rates. So this is the total cost. We would actually get a 1% reduction to the total cost. And again, he's here, but I'm telling you this. So the cost for the life insurance is about 4,000. 1% is 12,000. So by adding the life insurance, we actually reduce our net cost by $7,000. So. He didn't hear that, that we're, they're paying us to take the life insurance. Uh, it's not because they want us to do it, it's because it's a $10,000 benefit. If we were a $100,000 benefit, then the 1% would be less than, the, than what, we, what the life would cost. Uh, the other thing is, is that we are looking at adding dental this year, so this, the city has never had dental in the past, and uh, so we are looking at making that voluntary to the employees. You were given a second sheet with some information on the dental. Uh, oh, oh, you're, oh, it up, you're yeah. being given a second sheet. Uh, but from the dental coverage, uh, again, similar to the life, if we do add dental coverage uh, and we offer it to the employees, then there's another 1% reduction. So by offering the life insurance and the dental, the rates that you see here, we will actually get a 2% decrease from the presented rates. The other thing that, uh, and Eldridge can tell you the, the process and how much I twisted his arm. I treat every decision as if it's my own decision. I work with a lot of employers and I realize the burden. And uh, so ultimately with Blue Cross Blue Shield, we did go back to them and just say, when we terminate the current program, there's going to be run out cost. Can you do anything? And uh, I actually appreciated their response. They said, we do not buy business. And because of that, we set the rates where we need the rates to be. We will not reduce the rates. If you add life, we have a policy. If you add dental, we have a policy. But we will not reduce the rates. If they, in other words, we have that $140,000 liability. Uh, they will not reduce the rates. They said our rates are set to cover our claims. Uh, but being persistent, as you know, Malin and Sue know, all of us together, we did twist their arm, and uh, they basically agreed to a $40,000 transitional credit. What that means is, is that we get $40,000 applied to our bill. It does not reduce our rates, so when we go to renew next year, the presented rates are the presented rates. It does not affect our loss ratio saying, well, you didn't actually pay this premium. It's a credit on the bill uh, that will hopefully offset some of that run out cost. So that will offset some of that run out cost, but make, your, make it a little bit easier as we do close out the current program. Uh, so uh, that's $40,000 of transitional credit. So did we look at any type of combinations where we'd be like partially self-insured and then we would have like reinsurance to capture that? That's what we are right now. So technically we are partially self-funded today. We do have reinsurance. Uh, without what getting, was our reinsurance limit? Uh, the current, 30, insurance, yeah, current reinsurance okay. limit was 30,000. I did note it here. There's a couple of large claimants right. uh, that drove the, that cost. Uh, we actually got a no increase. So 
without getting into all the numbers, we actually got a no increase on our fixed cost, which is very, very good given that our loss ratio this year will be close to 200% on fixed cost. We got a no increase on fixed cost. Uh, without getting into all the details, there were uh, just with the, the mayor and HR, they did have other agencies look at it, just send it out to see, you know, am I doing my job and due diligence? Uh, but we did, we were able to get that down to a no increase. Where the increase is coming from is we're going to end this year on the amount that you can pay in claims, so not your large claims, but the amount you can pay. Uh, we're going to end this year probably close to 110 to 120%. <coughs> and they use a 25% corridor. So the 45% increase is merely <coughs> driven by claims. And uh, yep. Sue and I had many, many conversations with Malin. If we had a reserve of half a million, uh, we'd be able to say, what's the likelihood of this happening or not? But based off of the current position of the city, our, our reserve account is at zero. You know, we'd need minimum 1.8 million plus building the reserve. Uh, the other thing that I will note, you do have a letter that's uh, addressed to the employees. Uh, so our renewal date is November 1st. And so we do have to get this out to the employees. And uh, Eldridge and I have meetings set up starting with the employees tomorrow morning at 8.30. So no pressure, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then like waiting till the last minute. Mr. Jackson, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Well, first of all, thank you for considering Blue Cross and Blue Shield. And my name is Eldridge Jackson, and I've been at Blue Cross and Blue Shield for 30 years. So I started when I was 10 or 11. <laughs> so, but uh, I'm also proud to be back here in, in Tahlequah. Uh, proud graduate of Northeastern State University. I was here from 1985 through 1989, so it's good to be back home. Go Redmond. Ah, absolutely. <laughs> back in Redmond, so. But uh, to kind of address what uh, Brian had mentioned, as far as the volume-based discounts, the 1% for the group term life, as well as the voluntary dental, those would come off of the rates, so you would see that reflective off of what you guys are being presented here. But as far as the transition credit, as opposed to taking that off of the rates, you're going to see that as a one-time transition credit off of the second month's bill. And so uh, this time next year on renewal, um, then that won't be factored into and actually coming off of the rates. So. The 1% will not be? No, the 40000 The 40000 40, transition credit. So it's one, we get a one-time coupon, basically. Sure. Okay, yeah. no more coupons for us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 We have meetings set all day tomorrow and tomorrow and Wednesday. Um, we did, you know, we did, we're able to look at the dental and, and, and to be able to provide that benefit. Our vision benefit is staying the same, but the same carrier uh, with VSP that we've had. Um, the dental coverage, if you look at the plan design, is uh, very competitive. It's a maximum benefit of $1,500. I think you'll find that pretty standard. The cost. Um, for employee, again, the cost for employee is five dollars a month. Um, so we, you know, we're working very, very hard. I know that some things aren't the best, but working hard to be able to put that benefit, but a very competitive benefit for family coverage on dental as well. And yeah. I, I would like to add on the time frame, we were happily skipping down the road of uh, remaining self-insured until we realized that we no longer had the cash. So that was when we seriously stepped back and went to look at the self-funded, or the fully funded. So the vision, do, do uh, does the city pay for that? They pay was that passed on? Okay. They pay nothing. And what you're seeing there for the dental, those would be the, the, the what the employee pays. The city is offsetting that by $22 and I think 74 cents or something, very, very minimal amount. So let me back up. I mean, I understand we're scrambling, but if I pick up on this right, we're wanting to get this through today so you guys can start meeting with our folks tomorrow. 
That's correct. Our plan renews November 1. And again, the mayor and I have been working. Um, okay, but we can, there's, nothing in our, there's nothing in our packet. I mean, it just seems like, you know, the only thing as far as I know is here is, uh, you know, discussion and possible action, you know, to uh, regarding the benefit renewal for the city of Tahlequah. And there's no, there's no rate plans in there. And so all of a sudden we're here, we get 10 minutes of like, here it uh, is. We've been these, are, these, are, these are your uh, options. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Trey, this really wrapped up and came together this weekend. I mean, we were making final decisions at five o'clock Friday as to what would be presented tonight. So it wasn't that there's been a long time that we've been sitting waiting on this and we're just sneaking this out to you. Truly, when we found out we had no cash. And so what we didn't have, we, you didn't have this last week? We were working happily to stay on a self-funded model until we realized we couldn't afford until it. Until we realized we couldn't afford it. Like we need a new car and we have crappy credit. I don't, I don't think that negates what he said, though. I mean, <coughs> this is a major decision that we're supposed to make for our 135, how many? 153 full-time employees. And we're basically supposed to make it on 10 minutes worth of decision time and looking at this. Well, and, and I so think I maybe, uh, and maybe not to, to, to reduce that credit, but just so you guys know, and I realize there, I've got two expanded folders in my office of every single thing that we have gone through. We have been working on that to present to you the best case scenario for our employees. I feel like that is a, a good recommendation. I recommend it. The mayor recommends it. I mean, we've worked on that. This isn't anything, when Brian says, we've talked to these carriers, we've gone through We've talked to other brokers. Have you talked um, to the employees? Excuse me? The employees? How do Have they we talked to the employees? How do they feel about it? Um, I, any type of, you know, rolling, any type of s listening session to, with them to see, you know, can they afford this? Is it something that they well, like? We are offering that they a competitive it? plan that, it, that... The other end of that is if they don't like it and then our employees <clears> don't take our health insurance, what does that do if we go from 100 reduces our cost and 40 if we go to 140 people that have the plan down to you know 75 and it may reduce our cost but we also have now 75 families and employees that don't have health insurance because we made this decision so sorry yeah, I understand a little bit yeah, yeah. yeah. and I'm going to jump in and on. piggyback sorry I'm going to piggyback off what Trey said and it's not just completely directed against you because there are other oh, no. department heads who come up here yeah. slam information in front of us and give us you know a very short amount of time yeah. to try to oh, make no. I don't feel yeah I would say it's not I'm no. tickled pink that this is happening for two years I've been saying we should bid out our insurance and get it together and, and you know, a year ago, we I talked about year. what's adding dental insurance and looking at that. So, before you just never heard it, it has nothing to do okay. with. So, with that. in it's previous just, times, you didn't bring it to the council at all. I was only here last year, right? So there was a discussion that Brian and I had um, with uh, former staff here at City Hall. Mm -hmm. Discussion was made, things were moved, and it went forward. But there were presentations, um, and that was. Coming off a good year of claims. Yeah, so you can't forget what the last two years of claim history has caused and, and the problems that that has impacted that. That is the result. That is so where what we're is, at. Elaine, what are you seeing as the main I mean, what is the what is the main change? I mean, the cost to the employee. What's the I mean, because that's really what it comes down to is what are they paying out of pocket? You mentioned that if if you go to the ER, mm -hmm. you've got to pay $25 copay currently. No, no, not the no. ER. No, the ER, if you go to the ER, you may have a, a simple, uh, there's a, a, a 20% um, wait. After deductible. Yeah, after deductible. And that means that you know the insurance, once they discount it, it's paying 80%, you're, you're responsible for 20%. I personally have been there, so I know what that means. Um, but you, what's you very on, are important? Are you on this plan? I'm sorry. Are you on this plan? I am. I'm one of those family members that's the on there. One that's uh, one that's a family plan, or I am. 
Okay. I am. She's actually the one seeing a $200 increase from this recommendation. And I will tell you what I'm going to do for my family because, you know, I do have a son who, and I just will throw it out there. He's graduated from college. He's on his own. And I'm going to have him shop for another plan for himself. Maybe he'll be married in a year and his wife is working on her math, or his soon to be wife is working on her master's. Great for them. So I look at this and I look at my husband and I and what plan works best for us. And for us to be able to go to this other plan and having the, the, the availability to have a $30 copay, which is better than going to the doctor who charges $220 as it is now, and I get a discount, and then I have to pay the rest of it until I get my $600. Not my 30, 30 and go. So there is a difference. And I think it's important, and, and I can only stress this for men, because I'm a wife and I'm, I'm, I'm female, but you know, men sometimes, and my husband is one who <laughs> hasn't gone to the doctor like he should. So you know, he found himself in a situation and trying to get him to go to the doctor, it's hard. Because he's like, I don't want to spend that money. Until he's in the emergency room and he spends a day in the hospital. And, and now we're spending a lot more money. Yeah, the, I'd like to address the timing, just because I do understand this is thrown upon you to make an immediate decision. Mm -hmm. But from from my perspective that we've been working on this, the first thing is is that you can't start the renewal process until about 90 days before your renewal. Mm -hmm. And so they won't look at it before. And the reason being is, is you could have an employee go, you could have an employee come, you could have a new cancer get diagnosed. And so our time frame is already limited. We can only start the process about 60 days in advance. And so we had an initial meeting where we basically yeah, said, yeah, so we had some meetings where we said, this is what's going to happen. Uh, as we worked on this, we did know that the Blue Cross Blue Shield quote was firm and final. And so what we were trying to do was to see, could we get creative on the current program? I don't view this as a reduction. We will be the ones, and with Melinda, but we will be the ones standing in front of the employees. If we were standing here saying, go from a $600 deductible to a $3,000 deductible, make that decision today, that'd be very, very hard. Uh, what we're actually saying is, is that you have a $600 deductible, this one's 1,000, but it includes co-pays. So not everybody has to hit the deductible. Today, you have anything done, and it's a very good plan. I mean, I, don't get me wrong, it's a very, very good plan, but you have anything done, you're hitting your $600. Where this plan gives them that option to go into the office, to go into urgent care for $20. So it's very, very comparable. And then from a cost perspective, our current cost ran 1.3 million, and the Blue Cross Blue Shield plan came in at 1.2. So what we're really presenting is we found an option that's going to be less expensive than the current year, less expensive, very similar benefits, and it just so happened that we're throwing out the plan B of the employees will have a week or two to decide if they want to step down or not from, a, from plan A to plan B. That's their choice. It's their payroll deductions. But this isn't, you know, from a, you have to make very, very hard decisions but we're not here saying, let's slash the benefits, let's increase payroll. We're here saying, here's an apples to apples comparison at the exact same cost. I mean, for a single, it was $25 and we're going to 50. Uh, and that's the majority of our employees. I if mean, we were staying on the current nine. program, you may consider going from 25 to 50. And then for the families, the employee spouse, it's going from 704 to 720, very reasonable. Uh, within $16, the employee child is actually going down, and then the family is going up uh, because it's four tier versus two tier. But it's very, very comparable. We're not here saying let's slash benefits, let's increase payroll, and make a quick decision. This is saying we found a solution. We took the last three months and went through every scenario possible to be able to present to the employees something that's going to basically, tomorrow morning, we're gonna be able to stand out there and say, this is a great deal, and we're glad that we have this option available. It's 
very, very similar to what you're doing today. And you know, three months ago, you know, we were looking at a $500,000, half a million dollar increase. We've used the last two months, I have used the last two months to go to every resource possible. They've contacted other agencies to bring in proposals. And so that's where we're at today. I think one of the brokers, uh, it wasn't until last week that they kind of said, hey, here's where we're at. So. Do we have any type of calculation on how much we um, will in get from the employee portion currently? Something we could use as a basis. Sure. Because what I'm curious, and this is not directed at you, I understand what your, what your function is here to do. But I'm talking about internally because as we mentioned, we've got a little bit of a cash problem. Yep. And so obviously we don't want to hurt employees, but we want to give them the best benefit we can, but the best benefit we can give them is a job. Yep. You know, so um, I think that's one of the big concerns we have up here right now. We have a lot of things going on that we've got to deal with in the imminent future. So, yes, I can give you a ballpark. I, mean, I can grab my laptop, but we have it calculated out. Okay. But the employee, I just don't know, like as far as the budget, what we've got budgeted, um, as far as those projections and how often they well, might be. This actually will come in less than what we have budgeted. Okay. okay. So Which we budgeted news. to hold even. And this actually will, with the 2% coming off because of the bundling, will come in just under what we have budgeted. So we're not going to make money on doing this change, but it does keep us from suddenly having to come up with another million. Which we've never been able to do. Right. And that's why the payroll deduction, so the recommendations of the payroll deduction were to get us in line. And so, Right now, the employees in that ballpark numbers, the employees right now are picking up a, just shy of 100,000 through their payroll deductions. So the 25,704, this takes it closer to about, I want to say like 140, 150. Uh, but it was needed. And you know, when you say, what does that calculate out to per employee? It's calculated out from 25 to 50 dollars. So we're collecting $25 more a month times 12 times 131. That's really where it's coming from. I agree with you guys as far as being grown stuff at the last minute. You know, I don't like it. It's also been in your shoes. Um, and I do know the time restraints on what these guys are under. Um, as a businessman in the situation that we're in, you know, I would say just go with plan B, but since they're offering, you know, and my experience is most of the employees are going to want more cash in their pocket to pay, so. I come from um, 20 prior years of employment and human resources and two different entities and <coughs> never tiered plans. So you had that plan A, plan B, one was even a plan C, and then you had the MEC, which now under the Affordable Care Act, you don't have to have the minimal essential coverage anymore because they've eliminated the requirement to have coverage for individuals. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm used to that. Um, I think it's a viable option. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that when you look at health insurance, you look at your demographic of people. Some people may want that other plan. Some people may want this plan, but they have an option and they do have an option to stay where they're at. Um, if they if they take that that pre, that that other plan, that they're going to pay a little bit more. But I think it's competitive when you look at the employee um, and child coverage. And one of the things that you know Sue and I really worked on was looking at that plan B. And, and when we have orders for child support and such, when having to throw somebody who makes, I'll be honest, we did twenty-seven thousand dollars a year. And then he's gonna have to pay $704 for health insurance for his only dependent child um, it is a real burden for some of our employees. So having an option, you know, having that other option and they can go to that other plan makes it more doable as well. And it may not change. Those numbers may be exactly the same. We may have those same numbers come in there. But as a self-funded plan, and looking at the history, that's what we have to look at. That's what we have to deal with. 
you guys keep saying 704, but I don't, where am I missing 704? That's what our current deduction is for an employee, whether they have a child, there's only two tiers. You're either employee only, or you are, um, you, you pick some other coverage and you pay 704 a month. Yeah, so so 352. This is the recommendation for the coming year. The current, the current, so over here, the current payroll deductions are $25 for a single and $704 to cover any dependents. It does not matter if you're employee spouse, employee child, or family. It's 704 payroll deduction to cover any dependent. So I understand exactly what you're saying of, hey, from a business decision, but if, if, if we want to have World War III tomorrow with a last minute decision, if we cut plan A, it will be very hard to tell an employee overnight you're going from 600 to 3,000. Plan A is very, very, very close to what we have today. And so really what we're telling them overnight is to help us make budget with rising cost of insurance, it's $25. And it locks in our cost at the 1.5 instead of our potential cost of 2 million plus. Yeah. Yes and it's less than what we had budgeted for the prior year. And it would have been helpful in this little blank spot right here to have shared that information with us. That would have answered a lot of our questions if we had all the information given to us. I mean, I think that it's great. I mean, I think that it's good that we're able to bring Blue Cross Blue Shield. I thank you for being able to give us this quote. And I think that it's great that we're able to offer our employees dental insurance, which is something that we should have done years ago and we didn't, and now we're able to do that. So thank you. And I hope that tomorrow, if we vote on it tonight and it passes, that whenever you're talking to the employees, they will see the benefit and that you'll be able to see the benefit. Um, and that hopefully a lot of your conversation won't be the fact that it seems to be through red directives being set up here, that we're balancing that we're looking for money on their back by offering them something that is just, you know, le less than what they have, which I think that, you know, this is a good plan. This is a plan that probably I have the same as, a, as, it does at the Cherokee Nation, and so I know that it, it works well, so. Is there further discussion, or anyone ready to make a motion? Okay. Yeah, I have to swap out. I was doing some quick math here. If you stick with the plan you're under now, you don't have the money to cover any more than what, 1.2, 1 1.3 million. You're looking at an additional 800,000 that you're gonna have to make up. That's gonna be $5,200 that you're gonna have to get from someplace per person. And that's gonna have to come from your employees. So you're gonna have to jack your employee contribution up. I mean, you're not going to be able to leave it at 25, no matter what you do. It was pretty easy when we saw the total numbers to say we can't <clears throat> stay with where we are. Well, I'm just saying, you know, yeah. that's... That's a lot of money. It is. Thank you. I know we talked a lot, so the last thing that I'll say is the last two or three weeks, what we've done is we've really put in the time so that when we make this recommendation, you can know that we flipped over every stone. Malin and Sue put me through the ringer. They wanted to know the top 30 providers that our employees went to. They, through, with Eldred's help, we had to go through every tax ID number of the top 30 providers. They made us check smoking sensation. So they, the last three weeks weren't you know, negotiating rates. It was, can we really make this recommendation? And that's what, that's what the last two or three weeks was, was we didn't want to bring it before you and say, make this quick decision. We're, we're putting our ourselves on the line saying, we've done the due diligence, and based off of the cost, that's one thing, but benefits and network pass the test, and we're able to do it similar to where we're at today. Do we get any special type of discounts for our employees for using the city hospital as no. an employee of us? No. Why is that? Whenever our, I don't understand that agreement with the hospital. That's a little bit out of my wheelhouse. 
Um, but I do know that there are other municipalities that do such a thing. I know the city of Miami um, has an agreement like that. They also are a Blue Cross Blue Shield provider. Um, you know, in addition to, to what you're seeing here tonight, um, prior to last uh, couple months ago, or a couple weeks ago, the, the new universe that we've always been testing, but I've been collecting data, not only from the other municipalities, but ha have worked very hard, and, and this is a very competitive plan. The majority of those folks already have Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Um, I've also checked uh, providers here in Tahlequah. The um, Cherokee Nation um, is a very large employer in Tahlequah, and they do offer Blue Cross and Blue Shield, and I have, um, you know, was able to get all the information that you have, so it's, okay. We have Blue Cross and Blue Shield in Illinois. And I happen to at least come by the prices, pricing for elder care as well. No, because I wasn't able to share that with you. No, but yes. you know, you can talk to anybody that may have um, you know that information. The same thing with Cherokee Nation. So you know, it's just like if somebody comes in here tomorrow and says, "Hey, I want to see that piece of paper," you know, an employee can share that with anybody as well. What percentage of our employees actually enroll because of, because of Cherokee Nation? You know, I think, um, I don't know the numbers, I don't know the history, I know that we have a lot of employees that are eligible in both places. Um, Hastings Hospital is one of our top providers. They also accept Blue Cross and Blue Shield. So, um, but I think uh, that's maybe one of the things that drives a lot of people that just take employee only coverage. And so you had mentioned that there's 150. Mm -hmm. uh, 153. 153. So we have 139 taking the plan. Uh, I was actually here when you went from zero to 25, and over $25 we had members drop out because they had other coverage. Uh, so if someone does look at this, maybe for $25 they said I'll take both, and now for $50 they drop out. Not that that's our intention, but if someone does go somewhere else, ultimately the city saves you know, $650. So it's a balancing act of taking care of the employee, but we also don't want to be picking up the cost where members could get coverage elsewhere. You know, at $50, that's very, very competitive. Very, and that is, is it's competitive with any other municipality that provided me their information. So remind me again, do we only offer benefits to regular full-time staff? Yes. Okay, so the 153 is the regular full-time staff yeah, who are full eligible time. to participate. Yes, ma'am. That doesn't include any of our... Part-time. Part-time, no. 990s. Volunteers. Volunteers. No. Gotcha. I do believe we have one person on COBRA. Okay. Okay. And we actually talked about that this evening, and that'll be an easy transition just right over, so... Does anyone want to take any action today? Well, I think we need to. I mean, I, I'll, I'll make a motion that we offer the plan A and plan B under this presentation. Is there a second? I'll second. There's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? If not, can we have a roll call? Councilor Ratliff? Yes. Councilor Combs? Yes. Councilor Hires? Yes. Councilor Long? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you for your assistance with this. And they will be with us here tomorrow uh, with our employee meetings all day tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Item number 14, discussion possible action to adopt ordinance number 1290-2019, amending part 12, planning, zoning, and development, chapter 2, zoning, general, and district three. Visions of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Tahlequah, including but not limited to definitions and uses permitted in R1 single family dwelling district, R2 two family dwelling district, R3 multi family dwelling district, C1 neighborhood commercial district, C2 general commercial district, I1 restricted light industrial district, and I2 light industrial district. Mr. Thank Johnson. You. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening, Council. Hopefully this is the last time that you have to read that link, the agenda item. Um, I think this is probably our fifth or sixth reading of this item. But uh, thank you to Councilor Ratliff for getting us uh, 
focused and um, so we were able to drill down based on that last meeting. Okay. So with the instructions of the last meeting, we were going to focus on what was in this table. And that's what I provided you. What is in your packet has some minor edits and we'll go through those. Um, so we've discussed tourist home, tourist courts, bed so, and breakfast. I'm sorry, you yes, said minor edits. Do we get a copy of the edits? That I'm gonna, they'll all be up on the screen. But we don't get a paper copy. Mm -hmm. No. I'm sorry, I was only here for a few hours today trying to put this together. I was joining everybody else being under the weather today. So, one of the minor edits is going to be the removal of tourist court all together, all the way around. I think it's going to make this entire ordinance cleaner. If we remove tourist long. court, hmm? what page is the one? Tourist court is, if you refer to this table that I have on your screen, it's the exact same definition as bed and breakfast, except the fact that tourist court is C2 and bed and breakfast is R3. Bed and breakfast has to serve breakfast. So what I've done is taken tourist court out of the picture, modified the definition of bed and breakfast, to exclude the need to require the serving of breakfast. It makes that definition a little more self-explanatory instead of trying to figure out what the heck a tourist court is. So, essentially, bed and breakfast replaces tourist court. This is what's in our packet. Yeah, yeah it's so minor, minor edits that uh, Grant and I discussed uh, this morning. So, Clint, go back to the, uh, the, box. the police council and ask for a paper copy. That's what you've done everything that's in our package. So yeah, you'll see some yeah, changes. you'll see some minor changes, um, and it might even be more with the alcohol one, right? So, tourist, tourist court needs to be stricken from the graph. Well, that's what we've and bed, bed done in the ordinance. The graph is not, that is just a helpful tool to help understand all the changes that we've so, made. So, bed and breakfast will be R2? That's what's proposed. I mean, that's what's proposed. So here's all the definitions. You know, the, the marijuana related ones are all new. You, they haven't changed. Um, one thing that we did change is we've been calling it commercial grower for marijuana producer. And so now one of the edits that you don't see is where it says marijuana producer. It says AKA commercial grower. That's one of the, one of the minor edits. Um, marijuana producer is a little more recognizable reading our code. Commercial grower came from the state statute. So when we reference these commercial grower and these other definitions, we thought it would be fitting to include commercial grower in the definition of marijuana producer. But that's the only change to those definitions is it says marijuana producer. Oh, it's up? Okay. Yeah. Just like you see it read, written there. If I can help you, mm -hmm. Clint, maybe each change you go through, you direct the council to the page so that they know what changes. So I don't have the page. Okay. I'll help you then. Yeah, so five. page uh, 26. And you're referring to the page of the council packet. Page five of the attachment. So you can see on the screen now is the way it's the way it's proposed, aka commercial grower. There's where we've stricken the tourist court definition. It's on the screen. Tourist home, it was already existing. It's not a definition that we changed or modified. It's just highlighting it because that's something that we are talking about. Now, if you remember, tourist home didn't ever have a home. There was never a permitted use zoning, dist a zoning district in which it was a permitted use. It's always been a defined use in our code. Tourist home has always existed but it has never landed in R1, R2, R3, C1, C2, C3. 
And so what we've taken is an existing use and definition, and we've placed it in R1. This is the first page of permitted uses, is what you see on the screen. This is R1. I don't know what that is in your council packet. And that's how it's presented in the council packet. Yep. So we'll keep moving. I assume this is page 30. So what we've done here is we've taken our existing use bed and breakfast and we've placed it in R2 <coughs> is the proposal. And we have taken it out of R3. And also um, a change from what's before the council is getting rid of the tourist court there, which was a type of that you did in So on page 30, we're removing tourist court, is that what you're saying? Right. And in the current code, it's not there anyway. That was just a scrivener's error, I guess. Oh, in R2. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, that's what we had proposed is moving it to R2 in previous discussions and meetings. Um, we've decided again to take it out for uh, less ambiguity between bed and breakfast and tourist court. This is the C1, uses permitted. There's no changes on that first page. Second page is where you get a change. And this is where forest, shop, greenhouses, and nurseries has always been. We're proposing to remove greenhouses and nurseries from a permitted use in C1 Neighborhood Commercial District. And then we're proposing to place marijuana dispensaries in C1 Neighborhood Commercial District. And that's what you can see reflected on the screen. The next zoning district that we get to is the C2 General Commercial District. And this is where a tourist court has always been located, is in the C2 district. And so we are just removing auto court and tourist court from the C2 district as a permitted use. And I believe that was all the changes in the C2. Which brings us to I1. Um, this is where I think there might be a change from what you have as a paper copy. Um, I think we had marijuana producer and marijuana processor both as a permitted use in the I-1, and we've only placed marijuana producer in I-1, as well as the two items that we removed from C, greenhouses and nurseries. So those are going to all be in I-1 as the proposal. Which brings us to I-2. And that's the last modification that we made. Marijuana processors are going to be located in I-2. That's proposed. What page? 38. He's adding marijuana processor between freighting or trucking yard or terminal and oil field equipment. Just to change from I-1 to I-2 because I-2 identifies processing of other products as well. Right. It seems more fitting. I think that was always the initial. And when did these changes get made that were different from one on a packet? This afternoon. And were they emailed to us today? I had to check my email. I had a job and a kid and stuff. Nope. They were just edits that Grant caught when we reviewed it. So Grant, is that every edit that you recommended? Yeah, if we're, again, distilling it down to... Just those uh, categories? Correct. Because, you know, we wanted to focus back to that. So in a nutshell, what was before you was moving, replacing Tourist Home into R1, um, converting Bed and Breakfast to R2 from R3, and making that basically what would be considered any kind of rental, um, Airbnb or bed and breakfast is kind of considered. Placing marijuana dispensary in C1, which the authority kind of contemplates understanding where that would be. Placing processor 
uh, in I-2 and grower in I-1. Moving nursery from C-1 to I-1 so that it lines up with the uh, grower crow. Okay, so I'm, I'm clear on all this. Um, what I'm not clear on is how to make a motion to, you know, so we can move on past this stuff. I think you guys have put plenty of man hours into it. Do I need to make a motion with each use and what the proposed zone needs to be? I would say the as proposed on his on the screen. I would say, or how would you feel? Yeah, because yeah, it technically can't be motion yeah, presented, is presented because what was presented to us was not correct. Sure. As modified so, here in. Yeah, I'm going to throw something else in there real quick before. If you go to page, well, let's see, it'd be page 29 in your book, in our book, page 8. In your home occupation. So it's kind of kind of vague there. I mean, are we going to be charging people that sell Cincy and all those other little projects? That's not what it says, though. It's a home occupation. Where, what are you asking? I don't, I don't follow what you're asking. I mean, it, it's still, it's still pretty vague. I mean, this is saying if you're working at home, mm -hmm. if you're a homemaker, you got to come get a, a license. I think license. We, I haven't read that, and we don't interpret it that way. Well, if you're selling Cincy at home, we're not yeah, saying that you have to come. All home occupations shall be required to obtain a valid occupation license from the city and shall further comply with the following. No person other than members of the family residing on the premises shall be engaged in a home occupation. I mean, I don't so. Okay, so I mean, so just to keep it on track, if there's, I mean, if that needs to be brought up before this board, uh, this body, or another date to make amends to that, that I mean, right. maybe that can be done. But or should we try to? I mean, is that that doesn't really impact what we're trying to do with the current? I mean, I make a comment that that's for the current code. There's no modification current code. I think. You guys directed to go back to those two. Yeah, might just, just put a star by that now, or let's just address you bring it back because there's also yeah we got other things in the so same can, chapter that we need to bring back and address. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Right back to the gap where we put it. Uh, we have a comment back here, Ms. Rogers. Um, yes. Am I understanding correctly that Chur's home has always been in our ordinance codes? Yes, ma'am. Okay, can you please explain to me exactly what a Chur's home is? I'll give you the definition. You want to go ahead and read that? You need me to read it? Pretty hard to read from back here. A dwelling occupied as, as a permanent residence by an owner or renter in which a sleeping accommodation and not more than four rooms are provided or offered for transient guests for compensation. You don't have any limit on that, Ben. Limit. It, if you're talking about that limit, it's no four more rooms. than four rooms. But what about people? Can those four rooms have 10 people in them? Each. No. <clears throat> but there's nothing here that says. We have other definitions that address the number of people that can stay in a home. Where is that? Family. The definition of family. But and so if you're talking about a single family dwelling, then that's the limit right there. But can a single, as I understand it, a single family dwelling also be a tourist home. Correct. So if it can be both, mm -hmm. then there would not be a limit on how many people could be in that home. Well, it's based on the rooms. But a room can accommodate a lot of people. What I'm saying is, is there not a way you could put a limit as to how many people they could accommodate in a room if they're renting out say a room if it's 20 or more persons then it would have to be in bed and breakfast which is r2 so a, an r1 single family dwelling could have five people in each room if you wanted to boil it down to that I, 
Chief Hammonds well, has something to address. You can only have five people in three rooms and four people in one room. Yes, sir, the, the, the code also <laughs> says that if there is, if there is more than five yeah. rooms, it has to be classified as a hotel motel and 20 persons. So 20 persons is a max. Even if they have four rooms, then if they have five people from more than five rooms or overnight stay would be classified in the hotel motel. So 40 persons is a max. Is that correct? Or 19. Okay, 19. Okay, you can have 20 people. What about the parking? Are you planning to say each one of those people have a car? Does that home, is that home required to have proper parking? I think we, have, we would probably address that through the new sites. If you're just parking in your yard and going up the street, then that's probably how we would address that. Is there a parking nuisance? We're not going to require a Airbnb or a VRBO to build a 20 parking lot home in front of the house. No. But basically, what you're turning an R1 into is an Airbnb if, from no. the way you're talking. What we're allowing is. So that's, but there's, but actually 20, they can have 20 people. I think it would be 19. In an R1 home, if, I, if I'm understanding that. I mean, in theory, yes. Okay. I think we, I think you're opening up a can of worms by allowing that because residents will have no way of going back if there's a problem, the ordinance gives that homeowner that permission and if and there's no recourse for the homeowner thank you okay and I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know the, i don't know the statistics on that just Stephen and you know, mayor i don't know if you guys have any idea as far as what the percentage i mean it seems to me that if if somebody lives in the home, like Mrs. Rogers, for example, if there's a smaller percentage of people that want to go stay the night in Mrs. Rogers' basement as opposed to a vacant house, is that, I mean, statistically, is it 90, do you know, 90%, a majority of people are staying in the ones that are non-owner occupied? I don't, I don't know the, the statistics, but I would say the chances are very slim that there would be 20 people staying in a, in a single house under five bedrooms um that's that would be and also and also not, that, not an ideal there aren't people really shopping shopping for that experience right and also to that point mrs rogers something you might take into consideration is the likelihood that you the likelihood that you would want to rent that space your basement to that many people right and so i mean i, I can't imagine that anybody would want that many people in their house for that same unit cost of $89 a night or whatever for 20 people to stay there. And, and I will speak to the owner's side of that is the wear and tear aspect of allowing that many people in your home is it just, I can't really see that happening. Um, you know, my, I have one that's a two bedroom and I allow um, a maximum of five people. And over five, they have to have approval. I had a group of seven want to come and I said no too many can't do it so um i think that's a scenario that probably wouldn't likely happen and if it did it would really be an outlier and probably not not going to happen so if you can't foresee a scenario where you could have 19 people staying in the house then drop that number down to seven eight nine whatever reasonable number would be i think the number was that's already at the prior code the person right code but that's a requirement for that size hunter put it in the device. I mean, you could have a basement full of migrant workers and be legal under that 19 of them in the basement, in bunk beds. You could. Migrant workers. Good. Yeah. 40, 29 days. Because this is short term rental. And this is, okay. 29 days and you roll the new green. All right. Yeah. And I'll make a, or this is mayor, I will make a, uh, um, a motion to adopt ordinance number 1291-2019. I'm oh, sorry, it's 1290 With with the edits as presented with with you know with the edits as presented on the screen. Have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Motion and second. Any discussion? 
Do we have a roll call, please? Councilor Rutherford? Yes. Councilor Combs? Yes. Councilor Hires? Yes. Councilor Long? Yes. Motion carried. We are going to jump out of order and um, move to item number 19, the proposed executive session. Is there a motion to exit? So moved. Is there a second? No second. Does we have a roll call? Councilor Combs? Councilor Myers? Yes. Councilor Ratliff? Councilor Ratliff. We have a request to. Councilor yes. Long? Yes. yes. You don't want to discuss this alcohol one? No. Before we did? No. Discussion related to salary range and or hiring on a temporary and or regular basis. Oh, sorry. Discussion of possible action related to salary range and or hiring on a temporary and or regular basis, a city administrator. I would like to make a motion that we hire Alan Chapman as the interim city administrator at the rate of $45 an hour, not to exceed 25 hours per week. Second. Second motion and second. It's up to you all. It was October 7th. Trying to get to December 31st. All you know is modify extend. Or can you just leave it like it is and change it later when we need it. I'll leave my motion the same. Thank you. Could we have a roll call? Councilor Myers? Yes. Councilor Long? Yes. Councilor Ratliff? Yes. Councilor Combs? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Okay. Returning to item number 15, discussion and possible action to adopt ordinance 1291-2019, amending part three, alcoholic beverages, taxation and regulation of the code of ordinance of the city of Tahlequah. Mr. Johnson has left. I'll make a motion to table to the mid-month meeting. Got a motion. Is there a second? Thank you. Discussion? If not, roll call. Councilor Combs? Yes. Councilor Hires? Yes. Councilor Rattler? Yes. Motion carried. Item number 16. Discussion possible action to grant a variance of the minimum lot size requirement of 6,000 square feet in Part 12, Chapter 2, Section 12.223. Area regulations E, intensity of use for property located at the north half of Block 3 of Block 4 Oak Park Edition, Cherokee County, Oklahoma. Is there anyone who can address this for us? Yeah, this little lot's been sliced and cut up. Everybody wants to be a homeowner. <laughs> See the normal strike. I guess y'all got these little picture here. It's not that, it's not that good. Okay, I'll show it to you there. But so you know, it's supposed to run in the opposite direction, but they went this way. Since there's a house here, this is whole entire four and three up. There's a house here, now I got to go lot three. This is what you're going to do. Put a house right here, maybe like the footage. Four and three, I believe. There's a house right this way, it takes the same car back. Would this be a single family yes. residence? Yes. And about what size would it be? It'd be a, a 1,092 square feet. Now, this would normally be something that you would do at the Board of Adjustments, correct? Yes. And they would be able to approve it? Board of uh, Debate, is it Board of Adjustments? I mean, they're no longer approved. Right? There's no longer a board right now, right? Yeah. Well, they haven't been able to get a quorum. Yeah. Which is why so the way you're coming here, right? Yes, yes, that's correct. Because you could sell the, like I sold this lot to four or two, they had to use to build a, a, 
carport with the apartment on top of it if you want that. You know, but, but then nobody want to really buy the log. I'll try to sell it. They say, well, you go get the variations so you can build one, then we'll buy it like one. She didn't want to do that. I was just going to sell it then. So, I mean, what used to be here? Was there a house that was there? No. There was nothing there? It just seemed too locked. There's there a house here that got tore down. And I'm looking at what, do you have this map? Is this map no, map for you? So that's your that's your spot, right? Yes, that's it. So in the 1940s, I think, when these things were built. I guess that's your layout of the house. Yes. Yeah, here's the. Uh, <coughs> oh, this is a driveway, and there's a house. Backyard, side yards. Yeah, the way out of the house. Yes. And that's I, mean, I, yeah, I, mean, I, don't, I don't see. I understand it's a variance, right? Is it considered a variance? So, what size is this lot? How many square feet is it? I think uh, Clint says like 5,600. It's 400 short. Okay. I mean, to me, you know, to me, it seems like we want. In, and, and even speaking to our uh, comp plan, you know, this, this housing, and it seems like I can't think of why we would want to keep a vacant lot as opposed to have a brand new city keeps calling the team. Oh, they are. You know, it's easy, it's hard to just, it's easy to forget about that lot. You go, oh, yeah, I will try to move this next year. It seems to me like it would be better for the community, better for the city to have a, a new home built in the neighborhood as opposed to just continue to have a vacant lot. Somebody has to go mow once a month or whatever. Yeah, right, and that's the only variance he's asked for. It looks like so he's still going to do setbacks and everything. We'll just have a small backyard. Does he have to curb it or gutter it or get a. Do a you said the car you drive away, you got to saw it. It says there's all the building codes. Clint, uh, he had a lead though, but he said he was for it though. He so he gave a recommendation for it though. That was just I mean, I thought it the very. Here's what it here. And again, it would have, if, if we could, if the abatement board could get a quorum, this would have happened in the abatement board. It wouldn't come to us. Assuming it's they the board of adjustment. Or right? board of adjustment, yeah, correct. Assuming, Assuming they would have passed it. I mean, I'm not, I won't make that assumption for them. If it would have passed, it would still come to us, right? Not the board of adjustments, because they're board of action. They have certain requirements. Certain things would have to come to you anyway. I don't know if this one fits. Depends on the size of the variance. And they have 750 to 800 feet yeah. of variances. You might think, yeah. So this particular one would come to you all if they've met. But anyway, it's before you. It's ripe to make a decision if you choose to. I, mean, I feel like this speaks to our comp, <coughs> you know, the comp plan that's not yet approved. But I mean, I think that that leans more towards filling in the missing teeth. You know, that's the way I look at this. Yeah. Could you speak up, please? <laughs> it's nice. Would you like to come up to the front? <laughs> no, She's I just want to be here. I, I don't know if the microphones are on or not. They're not working tonight, Miss Dyson. Thank you. You bet. So, do you want to make a motion? I do. Um, a motion to approve as presented. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Yes. I have a motion and second. Is there further discussion? If not, roll call. Councilor Hires? Yes. Councilor Ratliff? Yes. Councilor Combs? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Item number 17, discussion and possible action to grant a special exception to part 12, chapter 15, outdoor parklets, section 12, 1506D, 8 and 9, in order to approve an outdoor parklet application submitted by Bill of Worthington for the property located at 200 North Muskogee Avenue. Sir. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Mayor Patron, Grant, Council members. My name is Bill Worthington. I'm uh, one of the owners over at Carter and Bear. We uh, have been working with Clint regarding this parklet request. When we looked at this ordinance, and we thought maybe we could apply it to our property to put a uh, kitchen in our business. So I don't know if, uh, we talked to you folks about that. Uh, we're trying to use our South Parklet area and put a food stand so we can serve food in our business. Well, is that, is that the, the, the city 
easement property kind of right up to the building. Oh, this far right here. Yeah, on the oh, south side of the property. <clears throat> So Sorry. technically, it could be designated as a parking spot. Is that going to be the same, the one you got parked behind it? You're just it gonna we're going to move it around and do some landscaping and things like that. I'm sorry, I wasn't really anticipating I was going to be presenting tonight or have some visual aids. But basically, when we purchased the business, we had planned to build on it the south side because we thought that that was part of our property. And then working with the city planner and things like that, we found out it wasn't. So we looked at this ordinance and we thought maybe we can use this ordinance because basically it's a parklet that's not being used. It's a grassy area that we're maintaining. There's no sidewalk there. Um, there's a dumpster there right now, but we would improve it, put our food uh, stand there, make it a permanent fixture, and it'll give us opportunity to make another place for people to eat downtown, um, increase our revenue, and in turn increase uh, taxes and revenue for the city. Which way do you want it to face? I mean, which way is because the food truck has this it's a it's, it's actually a stand it's like a, a mobile kitchen so it's not a truck it's a more of a trailer okay but we're looking to fix it plumb it put utilities to it dress it up make it look nice and serve inside of our business not out on the street well, which is so, they, so it's not going to face you're not going to be able to go up to the window and order like concession not, or anything we're not planning that right it's now. come through the side of your business or? through our window on our south side of our building we're going to connect it to the side of the building lock it down and so they can have a parkland is that okay ray i'd have to look at it so it doesn't okay. fit that so parkland so they can have a parkland the, okay. the I'm, I'm gonna have to read it before i say well so other businesses in town are doing it like lenny burroughs has a very similar setup to what we're asking so we're not trying to like reinvent the wheel we're just trying to find some real estate that we can make our business a little bit bigger and you know provide the services that we want to provide and, so, and so we're willing to pay rent so this is a rentable uh, I'm, uh, so they can have a parklet so the question is before us tonight is to give it a special exemption because if you look at the parklet ordinance it says you can't have alcohol that's number eight so that's what they're saying to give a special ordinance for section 12 15 and 6 the eight and nine so that you can't have alcohol on the parklet it, and you can't it, have it just be strictly food though on that section right just a kitchen no and alcohol. you can't have what you it says permanent you the licensee shall not erect attach or affix any permanent fixture upon the public right of way right so i think that is the plumbing the stuff that he's talking about correct right so the twofold to correct now just to clarify what you're saying, <coughs> you can have alcohol but not unless it's instant to food. Right now they don't have right. food there, so kind of cleansing that to some degree by saying, oh, we're gonna put a permanent kitchen in that spot as well. So I really don't think, in my opinion, eight is not the exemption that we're needing. I think they're giving well, us the eight, but a nine is probably the exemption that really we're- You can't be, to wait. another argument though, is you can't be instant to food unless you have a permanent kitchen. So it's kind of a chicken or the egg to some degree. Um, to get to get our health uh, permit we need to anchor it down with plumbing utility um, so that's not really for the parklet portion of it we need the parklet to put it there but in 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 you know uh, consideration of your comment it is mobile so if for some reason there was a need to use that easement i mean we're not looking to move it but it wouldn't take a lot of work to say okay we need to pull some of this off and move it temporarily while the city maybe had to run sewer lines or whatever through there and they were move it back and they were done. So Do that's you have any kind of a sketch or schematic of what that would look like? Because my mind is just going from one extreme to another I, as to how actually I do. I turned it into a plan for the city planner. Um, I may have a picture on my phone that would help, but I turned the whole park with packet in and it had a rendering of what it would look like. Not this? No, not that one. That, that is one of the sketches that he asked for. But, uh, yeah, but my only, my only concern really is if the, when you got a fryer in there? Yes. And we have a, an industrial kitchen in this, uh, this concession stand basically is what it is. And it has a, a fire hood, a fire suppression system. And I mean, honestly, looking at the kitchen and looking at other kitchens in town, 
I mean, it's an industrial kitchen with the, I mean, with all the fire safety. I mean, it's probably better than a lot of restaurants operating. We have, we have some pictures of the trailer going. Yeah, here's the, this one. I mean, I assume even though they're getting, they're asking for the parklet, they still have to go past health code. Yeah, I mean, this is right. Yeah. I mean, it's still yeah, have to have all the staff. Something else that I don't think is before you tonight. Uh, I mean, <coughs> It, it is, but I've been told that temporary uh, food trucks, et cetera, can only sit for six months in the location. So it's something that I guess would come back, or you see what I'm saying? It's a. Uh, I don't know if you've seen is that the same one? one? Yes, I drove by and looked at it today, and I figured that's what you guys were, you know, that was the. Yeah, we're trying to paint it. And this is kind of the, the rendering, but they didn't, we weren't planning on fencing around it and making it you know, look a little bit more curved. But I, I think if you look downtown, did, did you see? It? Yeah, yeah. If you look at what we took over the company in April, and we were in constant, you know, improvement, and we're still looking to improve. We can't do this. I mean, obviously, we'll try to do something else. But I think we've been a good steward of our resources, and we're trying to increase foot traffic downtown, move uh, south downtown and north downtown, and blend them together. And you know we need food, we need lights, we need entertainment, and that's just another piece of what we're trying to do. So that's why we're asking. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't think we're trying. I don't think we're trying to slow that down. I think we want to. We want to see that happen. We just want to make sure we're doing it within the confines of. You know, I mean, since Clint went to him, um, he well, I, I to first him, so spoke with Mark Seacrat, and he told me what you know things I could and couldn't do. And then I end up with uh, Mr. Johnson, who was the city planner, and he introduced me to this code. And he thought that with your permission, that this maybe could fit in the code because basically, this is similar to a parklet space, although it's on Shawnee and on Muskogee, and, but it's not being utilized. The, the city right now, since we took this business over, it's not even mowing the grass on that parklet. We're mowing the grass on it, and we're maintaining it. We're just asking, can we improve it? and put something on that we can use. My, my, my only thing, if I say my only thing, Grant, you said something about six months. Would, I mean, would the definition, would the definition of a mobile unit or whatever change if there were, I mean, if they were to remove, remove the wheels and tires and put it, not, I mean, I'm just saying you take the tires off and you put it on, you know, and you put it on blocks as opposed to just having, because I don't think, I don't think it's going to do you any good or anybody else any good for you to be able to, like your rendering where you can see the tires. Yeah, we're planning on dressing that up a yeah. little bit. The, the health uh, code people tell me that if we plummet to sewer, water, and electric, that we can, it can be considered a, you know, a fixed restaurant. So that's what she's telling me the code says. We have a couple of other people with some comments behind you, so uh, let them do it. Uh, have you talked to the fire marshal about this at all? You met with him or? Not yet, no sir. I, I would recommend that you guys uh, keep this over to the next meeting and postpone it until we're able to, this is the first I've known about it. Uh, we didn't get any notice from Clint on that day what this was about. I mean, we, we have to look at it. We have to look at what the submission is and we haven't seen anything. That's my recommendation. Yeah, and to, to the applicant's credit too, I think these are annual licenses that are start December. So you, if you did your premium paying, you see a good amount of money for two months, roughly, or three months. Right. And again, right. Yeah, I, yeah. I saw, I saw that. that. Is that strange? Is that should it not be that's, annual? That's the way it's set up. It should it not be from prorated or something? Well, I mean, not necessarily just <laughs> for me. <laughs> just a, a renewal. I mean, when you go from, say, I don't know, what's mid month to be, say, October 14th to October 14th instead of October. Yeah. That's not the way it's written, though. You'd have to make that as, as another variance. We, we do have another comment here. Uh, I just want to say, it just, I, mean, I love the idea of what you're trying to do, but this does not fit Parklet ordinance at all. I mean, Parklet ordinance is mainly for additional seating. And it has to be shared with the public. I mean, you're one to uh, really, and yeah, it just doesn't work. It's main, mainly meant for parking spaces where you can add additional seating out in front of your restaurant or space. And it's a parklet that is shared to the public. You're wanting to use this for your own personal use, which if you feel reading the ordinance, that doesn't, doesn't really fit. I'm, there's got to be another way, though. But I, don't, I think you're going down the wrong path with the parkland. 
Yeah. You're saying as opposed to like a lease because or some other ordinance that might need a variation to be able to allow for a more permanent something. Well, look, it's almost like they really need an exception to like the right of way to be able to there you go. park their a vehicle well, or a right truck way. in the right of way does not use does anything umbrella rather than not the right one. Like permission to utilize the right of way for a period of time. Yeah. Well, so I, say, I think we should probably table it for now. Yeah. Right. So this is, I'm going to table it for now since Clint's not here to kind of talk about it and then we'll try to work out and see if maybe there's something that might work better for you guys as far as the. So is Clint, is Clint going to be the one to talk to to try to get that done? or who do I, I mean, uh, We'll contact I, Clint and Clint can get in touch with him. Fire marshal and send They're supposed to notify us on any of that stuff, and I, like I said, we had just first we've seen it. Yeah. Also, so that maybe we can help streamline this regional. Then, is there any estimated timelines for this that you're already? Well, we've already, already put this off for probably two months trying to get this meeting right here. So, I mean, every, you know, when we try to get things done. I know some of you guys know when you're doing something, you have a lot of you know blocks you got to check before you can do anything. You have to, pay licensing, pay taxes, you have to get checked off over here, you got to work with this person. I mean, it's it, it's a uphill battle trying to get anything done. And everybody tells me we want business downtown, we want you to improve, but I mean, frankly, the only product we have in our business right now is our beer. And it's hard to pay 29% tax and, you know, pay rent and pay overhead and things like that. And, and when you try to improve, you, you know, this has taken us, you know, we've had it since April and we still can't get through there. I think if, uh, if you look at the piece of property, we might be able to do this. Sell it to the farm. Sell so it right away, you're saying? Yeah, just sell it because it, it'll never be used for anything unless we decide to clear off and make a four lane street. You still own it now, though, or is it leasing it right now? We are leasing the building. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, tabling it means that it would come back at the mid-month on the 21st, so okay. it's a two-week delay. Okay, sure. I don't even think that we really we need to table it. Because it has to come back as is. Okay, do you want to take no action then? And I don't think what, I mean, I think we can get with Clint, because I don't think really this is what they need. I think they need like a right-of-way. A, a waiver of the right of way or a waiver allowing them to use this space rather than creating a parkway. Does that make sense? I mean, I think your idea, I, we can achieve your idea. I don't think the parkway's the way that we need to achieve it. I think that there's probably. Let's give them an easement to that right of way. Right, that's and what then I mean. And then let them go through the fire marshal and just get all the help. You guys are coming Thursday, aren't you? And all that kind of yeah. stuff. To look so we'll show them what the right thing we need to do. I mean, I think we really need to work with some easements. We were requesting for that uh, fortunate property uh, tonight, or is that something we have to come back and ask for? Yeah, yeah unfortunately, it's not. It, we can't do it tonight because it's not on the agenda for tonight. Oh, I see. Okay. In two weeks. Right. So work with we can't put it on the agenda. We'll work with plan to get the easement request. Thank you for your consideration. Well, Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Quick question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is Park Club Chapter 15 allowed for special exceptions? Or is it just a straight up ordinance? I do not know this one. I think as a council, we can make special exceptions to any little ones. That well, I thought the park ups were just on the Scobie Avenue and that this one was on the Shawnee. Well, if somebody made bad business decisions, it's not the city's responsibility. I don't think the park ups are going to be sitting on the city. They should have been talking about it. Unfortunately, council is uh, put in a very other awkward position because when people acquire a property, they get a title opinion and they have intended use. And but they're putting you in a position because they don't do any due diligence in advance to see what they expect to need of the property would be. And 
and then you all have to work through the issues because they didn't perform their due diligence. And I have a, really a lot of empathy for you because most people would read a contract, see it the intended use, put provisions in the purchase of the property that would reflect that. So I just want to share that with you and insight if you if you have a prudent man approach to it. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yeah, but they, they don't own the property, right? Or, or right. Like so item number 18 is discussion possible action to convert Park Avenue to a one-way street from the south terminus to Downing Street and restrict the direction of traffic movements to northbound only. Was there a rephrasing of this? Yes. Yeah. Assuming you guys are wanting to entertain this one-way concept, you will want to... <coughs> You don't, want to, you don't want to start on the southwest point, otherwise you can never utilize that one way street because it's a dead end at that point. Right. So, where the street starts at across is that Chickasaw? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chickasaw. You see what I'm saying? So, that's where you would want to start the one way towards downing if that's something you're wanting to enter. You know, I was thinking about that. Should we not? I guess it's going to make it easier, but should Chickasaw, you know, because I was looking at some of these houses that you see, like where it says subject area, you know, there's the two, those are all those houses on the south side of Chickasaw have been removed. Yes, and so and the, could that not also be the trail? Is that street? that is exactly why this request is here because that street is going to ultimately be a part of the trail or at least a portion of that street, and so we want to limit the traffic to one directional flow so that the other side of the street can be marked off and maintained as the set piece of the trail. Okay, so that leaves that leaves two houses. Right on the east side of the street. West, well, maybe on the east. Yeah, because yeah. there's two have one closest right. to Choctaw and then one next right. to it that we don't that we don't know, right? right? And it's the west side that we would be using for the trail. We the west side for the trail. That's of the street. what Clint has been talking. Because so I was more of the opinion that we should just. Um, well, I guess we can't do that based on this map. So. We can I mean, put some until next time on this one. It list. seems like maybe we should put some blockades there. The, yes. Right? Um, so, so if somebody can't come down to Chickasaw, so somebody, can't go, some, somebody can't go east on Chickasaw and then get down to where the houses used to be and then take a ruck. Because you can't, if there's, uh, what do I say, barricades or pillars or something right there, then you have to naturally turn left. Correct. You can't get back. There's nothing there. That's a trail. Are all those houses gone? They're gone. They're gone. Yeah, that's what I was saying. It seems to me like there just needs to be a, you know, like a pillar in the street here and then one in the street here where you just, when you get there, you, there is no right turn. Those bollards and the striping and everything is a part of the trail construction. Mm -hmm. But uh, before you can do any of that, you need to be directing the traffic so that it is not too late. So that was why this request is here, but if you'd like, we can table to mid month right. on that as well. Did you say there was something wrong with the verbiage? Yeah. Well, this is broader than it needs to be, so it's okay to take action if you wanted to tonight. But, but if, we take, no, if, we, if we take if we table it, then it comes back the same. If that's fine. It, it, like I said, it's broader than what I would recommend yeah. because it talks about the South yeah. Terminus. Uh, to Downing, which would be further south than you would want to start a one-way street. Does that make sense? Right. So where it terminates on the south end, clearly you don't want a one-way street there or something, but just, it gets, there'd be a car pile up there, I guess. Follow the law. I'll make the most of the table list, so I like this. That's more good. Uh,
Do we have a second for the motion? Myers. Okay. Do we have a roll call? Yes. Councilor Ratliff? Yes. Councilor Combs? Yes. Councilor Myers? Yes. Motion carried. Number 21, discussion on the mid month special meeting. Well, we don't. Deanna asked for a. Yeah, forget that. Thank you. I was going to try to do that conference, but I've canceled all of that. I would be willing to consider a different date that week. Not set the date tonight. We can do that. I think that's a good plan. You are so good. <laughs> okay, and then the item number 22, adjournment. So moved. Yes. Roll call. Councilor Combs? Yes. Councilor Hires? Yes. Councilor Ratliff? Yes. Right. Again, thank you to all of you who stayed. Uh, no, they are both.